The Egyptians, in agreement with their climate, which is unlike any other, and with the river, which shows a nature different from all other rivers, established for themselves manners and customs in a way opposite to other men, in almost all matters. For among them, the women frequent the market and carry on trade, while the men remain at home and weave, and whereas others weave pushing the woof upwards, the Egyptians push it downwards. The men carry their burdens upon their heads, and the women upon their shoulders. The women make water standing up, and the men crouching down. They ease themselves in their houses, and they eat without in the streets, alleging as reason for this that it is right to do secretly the things that are unseemly, though necessary, but those which are not unseemly, in public. No woman is a minister, either of male or female divinity, but men of all both male and female. To support their parents, the sons are in no way compelled, if they do not desire to do so, but the daughters are forced to do so, be they never so unwilling. The priests of the gods in other lands wear long hair, but in Egypt they shave their heads. Among other men, the custom is that in mourning those whom the matter concerns most nearly have their hair cut short, but the Egyptians, when deaths occur, let their hair grow long, both that on the head and that on the chin, having before been close-shaven. Other men have their daily living separated from beasts, but the Egyptians have theirs together with beasts. Other men live on wheat and on barley, but to any one of the Egyptians who makes his living on these, it is a great reproach. They make their bread of maize, which some call spelt. They knead dough with their feet and clay with their hands, with which they also gather up dung. And whereas other men, except such as have learnt otherwise from the Egyptians, have their members as nature made them, the Egyptians practice circumcision. As to garments, the men wear two each and the women but one. And whereas others make fast the rings and ropes of the sails outside the ship, the Egyptians do this inside. Finally, in the writing of characters and reckoning with pebbles, while the Hellenes carry the hand from the left to the right, the Egyptians do this from the right to the left, and doing so they say that they do it themselves right-wise and the Hellenes left-wise. And they use two kinds of characters for writing, of which the one kind is called sacred and the other common. They are religious excessively beyond all other men, and with regard to this they have customs as follows. They drink from cups of bronze and rinse them out every day, and not some only do this, but all. They wear garments of linen, always newly washed, and this they make a special point of practice. They circumcise themselves for the sake of cleanliness, preferring to be clean rather than comely. The priests shave themselves all over their body every other day, so that no lice or any other foul thing may come to be upon them when they minister to the gods, and the priests wear garments of linen only and sandals of papyrus, and any other garment they may not take, nor other sandals. These wash themselves in cold water twice in a day and twice again in the night, and other religious services they perform one may almost say, of infinite number. They enjoy also good things, not a few, for they do not consume or spend anything of their own substance, but there is sacred bread baked for them, and they have each great quantity of flesh of oxen and geese coming into them each day, and also wine of grapes is given to them, but it is not permitted to them to taste of fish." Beans, moreover, the Egyptians do not at all sow in their land, and those which they grow they neither eat raw nor boil for food. Nay, the priests do not endure even to look upon them, thinking this to be an unclean kind of pulse, and there is not one priest only for each of the gods, but many. And of them one is chief priest, and whenever a priest dies, his son is appointed to his place."
The males of the ox kind they consider to belong to Epaphos, and on account of him they test them in the following manner. If the priest sees one single black hair upon the beast, he counts it not clean for sacrifice, and one of the priests who is appointed for the purpose makes investigation of these matters, both when the beast is standing upright and when it is lying on its back, drawing out its tongue, moreover, to see if it is clean in respect of the appointed signs, which I shall tell of in another part of the history. He looks also at the hairs of the tail, to see if it has them growing in a natural manner, and if it be clean in respect of all these things. He marks it with a piece of papyrus, rolling this round the horns, and then, when he has plastered sealing earth over it, he sets upon it the seal of his signet ring, and after that they take the animal away. But for one who sacrifices a beast not sealed, the penalty appointed is death. In this way, then, the beast is tested, and their appointed manner of sacrifice is as follows. They lead the sealed beast to the altar, where they happen to be sacrificing, and then kindle a fire. After that, having poured libations of wine over the altar so that it runs down upon the victim, and having called upon the god, they cut its throat, and having cut its throat, they sever the head from the body. The body, then, of the beast they flay, but upon the head they make many imprecations first, and then they who have a market and Hellenes sojourning among them for trade, these carry it to the marketplace and sell it, while they who have no Hellenes among them cast it away into the river. And this is the form of imprecations which they utter upon the heads, praying that if any evil be about to befall either themselves, who are offering sacrifice, or the land of Egypt in general, it may come rather upon this head. Now, as regards the heads of the beasts which are sacrificed, and the pouring over them of the wine— all the Egyptians have the same customs equally for all their sacrifices, and by reason of this custom, none of the Egyptians eat of the head either of this or of any other kind of animal, but the manner of disemboweling the victims and of burning them is appointed among them differently for different sacrifices. I shall speak, however, of the sacrifices to that goddess whom they regard as the greatest of all, and to whom they celebrate the greatest feast. When they have flayed the bullock and made imprecation, they take out the whole of its lower entrails, but leave in the body the upper entrails and the fat, and they sever from it the legs and the end of the loin and the shoulders and the neck. And this done, they fill the rest of the body of the animal with consecrated loaves, and honey, and raisins, and figs, and frankincense, and myrrh, and every other kind of spices. And having filled it with these, they offer it, pouring over it great abundance of oil. They make their sacrifice after fasting, and while the offerings are being burnt, they all beat themselves for mourning. And when they have finished beating themselves, they set forth as a feast that which they left unburnt of the sacrifice. The clean males, then, of the ox kind, both full-grown animals and calves, are sacrificed by all the Egyptians. The females, however, they may not sacrifice, but these are sacred to Isis. For the figure of Isis is in the form of a woman with cow's horns, just as the Hellenes present Io, in pictures, and all the Egyptians without distinction reverence cows far more than any other kind of cattle, for which reason neither man nor woman of the Egyptian race would kiss a man who is a Hellene on the mouth, nor will they use a knife or roasting spits or a cauldron belonging to a Hellene, nor taste the flesh even of a clean animal if it has been cut with the knife of a Hellene, and the cattle of this kind which die they bury in the following manner. The females they cast into the river, but the males they bury, each people in the suburb of their town, with one of the horns, or sometimes both, protruding to mark the place. And when the bodies have rotted away, and the appointed time comes on, 
Then to each city comes a boat from that which is called the island of Prosopitis. This is in the delta, and the extent of its circuit is nine scoinus. In this island of Prosopitis is situated, besides many other cities, that one from which the boats come to take up the bones of the oxen. And the name of the city is Atarbachus, and in it there is set up a holy temple of Aphrodite. From this city many go abroad in various directions, some to one city and others to another, and when they have dug up the bones of the oxen they carry them off, and coming together they bury them in one single place. In the same manner as they bury the oxen, they bury also their other cattle when they die, for about them also they have the same law laid down, and these also they abstain from killing. Thank you.